Lovely to see you all. Thanks for being in church today. I want to get straight into what we want to talk about just as the, as the young people and the kids leave. Um, we sang just now a beautiful song. This is my story. This is my song. It's all about having a blessed assurance that Jesus is mine. And there is some very useful terminology that sometimes comes. And I love the term of every person having a faith story. Every one of us has a faith story. For some people, their faith story never really starts because they never get into the faith. For some people, their faith story is an exciting one. It's full of adventure. It's full of challenges. It's full of seeing God doing stuff through the ups and downs that life has to bring. And they have, at the end of the day, a great story to tell. And I I think sometimes when we get to heaven one day, you're going to say, what are we going to do in heaven? I think we're going to tell our faith stories to one another. And we're going to talk about the faithfulness of God while we were down here on earth. And we're going to, we're going to share. I hope you have a decent faith story to tell. Some of us need to write a better story. But uh, we, we have a, a faith story. Now, the passage that we're looking at at the moment is, is the end of the life of a man who had a great story to tell. He had an incredible faith story. His name was the Apostle Paul. His story ended him with him physically in prison. He knew it was the end of his life. It was a time of great persecution in the church. And he tells his faith story in three statements. This is what he says. I have fought the good fight. I have kept the faith. And I have run the race. If you don't believe me, let me read it to you. You'll find it in the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 4. And these are some of the fi- final words of this great man of God as he ends his life in a stinking prison. And I think for me it's the context under which these words are written that speak sometimes even more than the words themselves. If he was living in comfort in a palace or if he was dying in a beautiful clinic and a lovely pristine kind of a a hospital, maybe it would be different, but he's not. He's in a stinking prison. He's hungry. He's been beaten. He knows he is soon to die. And he says this, verse 6, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time for my departure is close. A drink offering was an Old Testament form of offering where they would offer unto unto the, the, the sacrifice that they had brought. And with all the burning blood, sometimes a horrible, you know, sort of a pungent smell would come. And they would have what they called a drink offering, which was a mixture of wine and water. And they would pour it upon the offering to to get rid of that, uh, that horrible smell and create a beautiful, beautiful smell that would go up to God. And he says, my life is like a drink offering. It's almost empty. The last drop is about to be poured. And the time for my departure is close. I have fought the good fight. We did that last week. I finished the race. I have kept the faith. There is reserved for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, and not only to me, but to all those who have loved his appearing. We're going to have a close of that where we talk about the race next week. But today I want to talk about what it means to, to keep the faith. We spoke last week about fighting the good fight. And if you need to watch it, if you weren't here, then go and get it and download it, and you can have a look at that because there is definitely a continuity plan here. But Paul says, I have kept the, the faith. Now that's a, an interesting thing, and I want to look at it under three titles today. I want to look, first of all, at the implications of this statement, because sometimes you have to look to the, to the stuff that's not written. You've got to look for the unwritten stuff in order to, to really get out of it what he's talking about here. Then I want to look at the ramifications of this statement, and then lastly, I'd like to look at the applications of what he's talking about today as we apply them into the context of our lives. So those are the three uh, headings that we're going to be looking at. Now, I was just saying to the team beforehand that 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 today I feel like I'm preaching a whole series to you in one go, because we're going to be taking hits at each one of these things, but I promise you there will come a day when we will come back and we will have a look at this and we'll have a sermon on each one of these aspects. But today, I only get one hit at this, so I'd like for us to, to be very broad, but I'm really hoping and praying 
that something will just drop into your mind and into your heart today as we have a broad look at this enormous subject which one day we will return to. First subdivision is, is the implications of I have kept the faith. Let me suggest to you this. There are five. Let me throw them out to you. The first implication of this statement is that of having to keep, you can't keep what you don't have. If you don't have a faith, there's nothing to be, be kept. In order to keep the faith, you have to have the faith. Now, I want to suggest to you that some people who are, who are a little bit nonchalant and some people who would think differently will say, oh, listen, I haven't got enough faith. I haven't even got any faith. I, you know, I, I can't, I'm let me tell you, you're so wrong. If you're thinking today, if you happen to be sitting here and you say, man, I have no faith. I can't believe in anything. I don't i got to tell you, you are absolutely wrong. There is not a person in the world today who does not have enough faith to become a Christian. Everybody has that. I know that because I've read John 3.16. John 3.16 says that whosoever believes in me shall have eternal life. The whosoever means everybody. There's not a person alive or dead in any section of the world who cannot claim enough faith to believe that Jesus is who he says he is. That the claims of Jesus are not real. There is not a person alive who does not have that faith. Because if there wasn't, then God would not be fair. Because he won't give this to some and not to others. He gives everybody equal opportunity because he puts a deposit of faith in every single one of our lives. We read about the fact that, that this little deposit, and Jesus uses a picture for me. He says, like a little mustard seed, the tiniest little seed. But when you put it in the ground and water it and care for it, that thing can grow to be the most enormous and fruitful of all trees. But it begins with a deposit of faith. And God has put that deposit of faith in our lives. We all need to do that. The second implication is that we need to keep the right faith. You don't just keep any faith. You've got to keep the right faith. Some people think that any faith will do. Some people think, well, I can just follow any faith from any, any place around the world. Everybody's got some kind of faith. Everybody's worshiping something and that all roads lead to God. No, 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 no. You've got to keep the right faith. And it's for that reason that Jesus came, so that he could give to us the right faith. When he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, he meant he is the way, the truth, and the life. When he said that he is the resurrection of life, he meant that he is the resurrection of life. Not some other guy out there, not somebody who's been a part of something, some religious sect or something like that. Jesus is declaring that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And he is the only way, the only truth, and the only life. So we've got to have the right faith. Now, into the context of what Jesus spoke when he said these words, you must understand the Old Testament went through a phase of what theologians call the polytheistic era, where there were many gods with small g's. Now, we know there's only one god with a big g, but at that particular time, as the religious world was beginning to shape itself, everybody had a different god. When, Joseph, when, when Moses went and stood in front of Pharaoh, and he said to Pharaoh, he says, Jehovah God has said, let my people go. And, 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 and Pharaoh would have said, but, but, but which god are you talking about? Moses, are you talking about this God of stone over here? Is he, is he the God you're referring to right here? Oh, no, no, no. Or could it be this, could it be this, this God of, of wood over here, this lovely shape and thing? Is that the God you're saying is telling me to let the people go? And he was so confused because Moses had to say to him, the God Jehovah, you cannot see him. <laughs> Pharaoh laughed and said, what do you mean, worship a God I can't see? We've got hundreds of gods, thousands of gods. Which one are you talking about? And then we have the story of Elijah, who came along with the same dilemma. And Elijah says to the children of Israel, guys, we're going to meet on the top of Mount Carmel, and we're going to decide who the true God is. Bring all the prophets of Baal. Bring everybody with all their different religions, and we will have a competition. And out of that competition, we will decide who the true God is with the true faith. And you know the story well. How the people came, they built their two altars. And the prophets of Baal, 450 of them, cried out with loud voices to Baal, come and take your offering by fire. And their God never arrived. And Elijah, standing there facetiously and sarcastically, says, hey, guys, maybe you need to shout a little bit louder. Maybe your God is, is deaf. Or maybe he's, he's sleeping. Or maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe he's got an holiday. Maybe you need to cry a little bit louder. And then he's crying louder. And he says, maybe, maybe, you, maybe your God doesn't think you're serious enough. Here's a few knives. 
Just demonstrate a little bit. Cut yourselves a bit and let's see if that impresses your God enough to answer by fire. <laughs> There's no answer. And then when they're all bloodied and exhausted at the end of the day, Elijah comes forward and he says to the nation of Israel, watch, because right now we will find out who the true God is. Takes his offering, kills it, puts it on, puts water on it. He stands back and he basically says to the Lord, he says, Lord, everybody's watching. Now show them who the real God is. And you read the beautiful account of how lightning came out of heaven and consumed the altar. And everybody said that day, wow, Jehovah is God and we will worship him. You see, people, even the Old Testament had illustrations of the fact that there is but one God with a capital G. But there are plenty of other little gods with little g's that people worship. The God of materialism, the God of self, the God of popularity, the God of power. There's plenty of gods with little g's, but there's but one who has the big g, and that is, you know, who it is. And so we see today that there's a, it's a specific faith to an exclusive God. So if you happen to be here today, we're delighted that you're here. But if you're worshiping other gods, then I have to break the news as kindly as I can. There is but one God who is the way, the truth, and the life. The third implication that we read, that endurance is important. The Bible says that those who endure to the end will be saved. You've heard that said before. That endurance in our faith story, we want to finish our faith story well. Now, if you do what I do, and for the many years that I have done it, you will see people whose faith story does not end well. You will see people who have this, this faith that seems to start well, and then slowly things happen and disillusionment and disappointment creep in. And then, and then they think, oh, well, listen, I'd rather go to the beach on a Sunday instead of fellowshipping with believers. And, and, and all of these things start creeping in. Each one in and of themselves not necessarily sinful. But over the course of time, that which was once hot and raging as a fire has now died a very miserable death. They have not finished well. And so when we see these three statements about fighting the good fight, you know, you've got to fight to the end if you want to fight a good fight. You know, if you, want to, if you want to run the race, it's not about winning the race. He doesn't say those who, oh, Paul says, I'm going to win the race. I'm going to beat you. That means I'm more spiritual than all of you. He says, I'm not running the race to win. I just want to finish the race. And he's talking about keeping the faith. There is something about endurance that is implied in all three of the statements, this being but one of them. Finishing well is absolutely important importance you don't have to win you just have to have to finish now we know last time in our last series we entitled it it is finished you remember that and we spoke about jesus on the cross how he had endured so much pain in his physical and his emotional and his in his mind and he he held on to the the very end he didn't throw in the towel at peter's denial when he's standing on caiaphas's house and peter denies that he, he does jesus Jesus didn't say, well, I knew that was going to happen. I'm just going to go back to heaven now. He endured that. Jesus endured the, the lies of Caiaphas. He didn't try to correct him. And when Caiaphas was throwing all the sort of lies and allegations and people were all concocting these, these ugly stories about Jesus, Jesus didn't just say, well, listen, I'm out of here. You haven't listened to a word I said. I'm just going to go home. Jesus didn't do that. And when he stood before Pilate and Pilate, the coward, washed his hands on Jesus and said, hey, I find no fault in this man, but do with him as you like. Jesus didn't sort of say, oh, well, listen, man, you big coward. You saw the opportunity to be the greatest hero in the world and release me. And look at you. you, you, you you're going to crucify me. That is stupid. And he, he didn't wash his hands and say, 10,000 angels, come down and wipe out Rome. He didn't do that. He endured to the very end. And even in Gethsemane, that time when he prayed, Lord, let my will but your will be done. Jesus finished so well. Despite the pain and the anguish and the agony, Jesus finished really good. I wonder how we'll finish. Because endurance, the implication is that endurance, people, is very, very important. Number four, the fourth applica implication here is that as much as you can keep the faith, the implication is that you can also lose it. Where did you lose your faith? As I would say to some people in maybe interviews, where did you lose your faith? You used to have such a vibrant faith. Where did you lose it? Now there are a thousand possibilities 
of where you could lose your faith. You could lose your faith at the point of pride and arrogance. You could lose your faith at the point of devastation in life and never really recovering. I don't want to belittle those things because they could be real in your life. But there's just two that just intrigue me. You can lose your faith at the point of these two things. Listen carefully. The first the place that you can lose your faith is at the point of too much. And the second place you can lose your faith is at the point of too little. Those two places, many people lose their faith. Let's look at the too much thing. Have a look at, the, have a look at Solomon. Solomon only just sneaked in by the skin of his teeth. He started so well. And then he started looking at all the other things and his wealth and his popularity and his power and his, and his prestige in the kingdom began to overwhelm him. And he only just finished well at the end when he repented and saw that all of that is like chasing the wind. Go and read Ecclesiastes. It's his repentance story. And he says, I used to think that I, I, my power and my popularity was, was where it was at, but I got distracted, he thinks. And he says to us, all of that at the end of the day is just like chasing the wind. Have you ever tried chasing the wind? It's kind of this wind. Then, no, 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 no. no get this, where, where's it now? You know, that's, he says it's a perfect description of what it is like when we try chasing that we can lose our faith at the point of too much. He had too much. Jesus told that parable of the farmer who had too much. Remember? He had a great season. He says, oh man, I've had a great season. And the wheat is out there. I'm going to break down my barns. And I'm going to put my wheat in there. And I'm going, to, I'm going to build bigger barns. I'm going to fill it up. And then I'll sit back, eat, drink, and be merry. And the angel of death came to him that night and said, you're a fool, man. You're a fool. You fell for it. You didn't keep the faith. You had too much. Some people lose their faith at the point of having too, too little. Kind of like Gideon in the Old Testament where God came to Gideon with the angel and said, hey Gideon, I need you to go and deliver Israel from the Midianites. Can you do that? And he says, oh Lord, I can't do that. Don't you know God? I'm so weak. I'm so pathetic. I'm from the weakest nation of the weakest tribe of the weakest clan of the weakest family. God, God I have nothing to offer you. I am just too weak. You see, both of those things. Here's the common denominator between those who have too much and those who are too little and lose their faith because it becomes all about them. I have too much. You know, I lose the fact that I, be, I become so self-dependent. I de depend upon myself to make more stuff. Or I have too little. And I can't do anything with this because I'm dependent upon myself. Self-dependence is a killer to your faith. That's why faith is all about a dependence to a, somebody outside of who you are. That's why we call it a faith. And the moment we become self-dependent is the moment we start to lose the faith. That's the implication of that one. What about the fifth implication? Yeah, that, uh, here's the implication. Is that faith is the key to unlocking the mystery of who God is and the mystery of life. You will never understand God through the eyes of natural eyes. You have to have eyes of faith in order to get close. And we'll never get that close to understand who, like, who can understand God. Who can understand the ways of God? How arrogant of me to think that I possibly could. But I do know this, that through the eyes of faith, I can understand Him a bit better. Through the eyes of faith, I can understand a little bit more about Him. But I have to see Him through the eyes of faith. And this is where some of us just seem to, to kind of fall down. Like, like, how can we understand the Trinity? <laughs> Anybody want to try and explain the Trinity? It's a mystery. And God's not going to tell you down here on earth how it works. He just gives you the basics. And we try and make it. And we put in analogies of eggs and of people. We, we, you know, we try and do all sorts of silly things with it. Who can comprehend the magnitude of God? It's crazy, man. We'll never be able to do it. Who can understand, if you don't have the eyes of faith, you'll never understand how prayer works. You'll never understand prayer. In your own carnal eyes, fleshly eyes, you've got, to have, you've got to have the eyes of faith in order to understand how prayer works. Who could possibly comprehend? Answer me this one. Who could possibly un comprehend why bad things happen to good people? Anybody want to answer that one? <laughs> I don't know how many times I've been asked that. I have no answer. I have to throw myself at the feet of a sovereign God and say, Lord, it's you. I don't understand you. I don't understand your ways. I don't understand why bad things happen to good people. Lord, I don't understand 
why bad people, you know, bad things happen to such wonderful, good, godly, righteous followers of Jesus. Why do they get cancer? Why do children die? Why do they lose their job? Why, Lord? I don't understand. I'm not even going to understand. Please don't ask me to ask that question. Why? I don't understand. It's a mystery. But when I put my glasses of faith on, I begin to see God a little bit more clearly. You know, when you look at our problems through the eyes of our problem, we begin to see God on the other side of the problem, and we get a distorted view of where God is. When you look at God through the eyes of your problems, you're gonna, you, God is, is, is a mess. But when you look at your problems through the eyes of God, that's when you see something completely different. It's kind of like my glasses. The older I get, the more I have to use these. And I hate wearing glasses. I hate wearing glasses. But I begin to realize this, that if I want to see clearly, I've got to put them on. Oh, yeah, you don't look that good, Mike, fellow, with the glasses on. But you look better with them off, Mike. But uh, you, know, you know what I'm trying to say? Is that when I, if I want to see clearly, I have to look through the eyes of faith. I look through God. Picture these silly glasses. I look through God and my problems. Hey, Amen. They look something completely different. But we've got to see them through the eyes of God. That's why faith helps us understand the mysteries of who God is and helps us to unravel through the eyes of faith the issues of life around us. Those are five implications. Let's move on. Let's talk about a couple of ramifications, or not ramifications, ratifications. Would you correct me, somebody? Ratification, not ramification. Ratification is where I'm affirming something. I'm ratifying a particular truth. Now, we need to live our lives not according to feelings or according to sympathy or empathy. We need to live our lives according to, to truth because truth is what's going to get us through this thing. So when we ratify certain truths, we begin to see that faith is an amazing thing. This has a few ratified facts about faith. The first thing that God, we tell us in the book of Hebrews is that without faith, you're not going to please God. That's the, that's the first ratifying truth. Everybody's trying to please God, I hope, but they're trying to do it through the strangest way. But if your faith is not, if, you're, if what you're doing is not of faith, it does not, cannot, and never will or never has ever pleased God. It has to be born of faith, lived in faith, expounded in faith, because faith apparently is the only thing that pleases God. That's what Hebrews tells us. Now, if you look at this, I, I, I want to take your ideas away from us, away from faith, to the idea of pleasing God. If your eyes are on faith, then you're going to worship faith. Then faith will become your God. But if pleasing God becomes the objective or the theme of your life, then faith will be the way that you do it. So I don't want you to go out there and say, I'm going to rah, rah my faith and I'm going to fire it up and I'm going to fire up my faith. Don't do that because it's not going to last very long because you can't sustain it. But when the theme of your life becomes the theme of pleasing God, then you will know as you live out that theme that faith is the way that you actually do it. Now, if you just look at the, the, the power of the, of the approving look, you know, if, if, you wanna, if, if we, wanna, God wants, we want God to look at us with an approving look, we know how to do it. We need to live by faith. The power of an approving look can drive your life. We all live it. We all want approval, do we not? When you're a kid and you're standing at the beginning of the race and you look up into the crowd of parents who are there, you know, too care to comes about who else is there, who are you looking for? You're looking for the approving look of your significant other who at that stage in your life happens to be your parents. And you're saying, hey, Mom, don't worry about the crowd. Mom, I'm here. Check me, check me, Mom, Mom. And, and, if, and if your mother does not give you the approving look, if your mother is not there to give you that look, then there's something that dies within you. But when you receive the approving look of the person who is your significant other, something wells up inside of you. Kind of like, you know, when, when you become a child, you become a teenager. And all the teenagers are trying to win the approving look of the opposite sex. Have you seen how they do it? I've, I've watched you girls. Fatty eyes, part your lips. Apparently that's meant to look appealing. And so, so that boys will look at you with the approving look. Ah, you do the, I've watched you. I've seen this. Thing. You guys, I know how you do it too. Well, I know exactly how you do it. For you, it's, it's about the angles. 
45 degree angle look. Every photograph, everybody's not looking at the 45 degree. Because apparently, that is the way that you look the most attractive. And why do you do it? You do it to win the approval of your significant other who at that stage in your life happens to be the girls around you. We all, don't, don't, we all, <laughs> well, you all did it. I never did. Because when you're hot, you're hot, you know. You, so you don't need all that stuff. But, uh, but you guys do this all, all, the, all the time. But uh, here's God looking down upon his son with the approving look. At Jesus' baptism, this is my son whom I am well pleased. Can you imagine how Jesus' heart, and he was a human being. He suffered the same things as we, the feelings that we have. And when he heard the voice of God saying, man, you had Jesus, you have my approval, man. That must have done something for Jesus that spurred him and encouraged him in the time of temptation for 40 days in the wilderness. And he said, why am I here? Because I'm here because I'm looked into the grandstand and I can see in the picture of heaven, I can see the approving look of my father. Get the transfiguration. And Jesus has done incredible stuff here on earth. But he's coming close to the time when he knows he's about to die. And he's meeting there with Peter, James, and John. And what does God do? He gives them the approving look and the approving word again. And Peter's babbling off about building shelters. And God says, Peter, be quiet. This is my son who I love. Listen to him, man. You know, and then Jesus, man, he felt the approving look of his father once again. People, people, people. Listen, if we could live with the theme of our lives being winning the approval of God, you know how you're going to live? <laughs> you'll live a life of faith because you'll begin to believe and understand that faith is the only thing that pleases God. The second ratification we want to ratify today is it's just a test. All of this faith stuff is just a test. People forever, God has tested stuff. When he made the world and he put the sun in the sky and he looked at it and he said, hey, that's good, hey. Why was it good? Because it looked pretty? Or because it just shot? No, no, no. The sun was good because it fulfilled its purpose for which God had ordained it to fulfill. And God said, it is fulfilling its purpose, therefore it is good. Let the vegetation grow. Let the animals be born. Let, the, let them replace. And God stood back every day and said, it is good. And we look back on man. He said, it is very good. And he, why was it good? It was good, not because it looked pretty. It was good because it fulfilled its purpose and it passed the test of God. God looks at us the same way. And faith is the greatest test that I know. You want to put yourself to the test? The last crisis you had in your life, where did you go first? That's it passed the test. Some of us use God as a last resort. He's like a reserve parachute. We only use them when we need them. But the test of faith is, where did you go first when you got that phone call about some tragedy or you got the doctor's report that said this? Where did you go first? Because if you did not go first to God, you fail the test of, of faith. He should be our first port of call. And sometimes because all else will fail, he will probably be for some the last resort. Where do you go when you have a tragedy and a crisis? Where do you go first? Now, I love the idea of finishing well, but it's just a, a nice uh, idea. But uh, I'm so sad to see people fail the test of sustaining their, their faith. And uh, they go through incredible pain. I just look at, at the pain of Job, and I'm saying to Job, Job, hold the faith. Keep the faith, Job. Don't give up, Job. When your kids died and you lost your business, Job, just keep the faith. And then I, then I look at Peter after he denied Jesus. And, and Jesus said, there will come a day when you will die just like me. And Peter's hanging there on the cross. And just prior to that, I'm thinking, Peter, you know how you're going to die. Peter, don't give up now. Peter, don't throw in the towel now. Peter, keep the faith, even if it means that you'll be crucified, as tradition says, upside down. Peter, don't give up. Keep the, the faith. And then I look at Paul in prison who wrote these words. And I look at Paul and I say, Paul, don't give up now. Don't give up now, Paul. And even amidst your problems, you know, they, they, he'd planted churches around and the churches were dysfunctional and heresy had come into one church and conflict had come into another church. And he would have sat in the prison and said, was it worth it? Was it worth me pouring myself out for the purpose of people who don't really care? What is it? And he would have said, just keep 
the faith. Even when the evidence suggests otherwise, people keep the faith. I'm pleading with you to keep the, the faith. Last week, we spoke about fighting the good fight. And almost, I came away from that sermon and I said to, I think it was Billy, I didn't do justice to that. I'd love to preach that sermon again. I think I'd do it a lot better next time. Because you can speak so nonchalantly about fighting the good fight, but when you're in fight, there's pain involved. And as I look across the people here, there are faces that I see who I know who have suffered incredible pain. <sighs> Just keep your faith. Don't give up on God. Keep the faith through the traumas of life, through the up and downs of disappointments. Don't give up. Keep the faith. It's just a test. And the objective of the test is that you should pass the test. And unless you pass the test, it's like school. You will never graduate to the next level in your spiritual journey. You've got to pass the test at the level that you're at. And when you pass that, God said, you graduate to the next level. So whatever the pain is in your weary soldiering of fighting the good fight, whatever the pain is, for goodness sake, don't give up. Just keep the faith. <laughs> Let's talk quickly about filling our faith tank. Because it, it, faith is kind of like a, a bucket and like a bucket and it's got holes in it and it leaks you've got to keep filling it you've got to keep making deposits into the bucket to, to keep it full and it's these deposits of faith that keep faith alive it's kind of like an investment account you know I know nothing about money and investment but this is what I'm told is that if you want to have a lot of money at the end of the day you've got to keep putting money in I believe that's, that's how it happens so, you know, if you, if, you want, if you want to make a lot of money, you got, every month you've got to put a deposit in there so that in 20 years' time you can, you can have lots of money. I like that idea. Um, but the, it, it's all about the deposits to keep the tank full. And when faith leaks as it does through disillusionment, here's one. There's devastation. There's another D there. Here's disappointment. And when faith leaks and leaks and leaks, then all of a sudden you find that you're running on empty. We've got to keep the deposits of faith coming in. That's why I, I think that, that faith is, is, is so important. I just look at Jehoshaphat. I'll give you one example of a guy who knew how to fill his faith tank. Jehoshaphat was told in 2 Chronicles chapter 90 that a bunch of kings were coming to steal all his wealth and kill him. So he, he does the right thing. He goes to God first. God was not his last resort. He did not go to his army first and say, Guys, how many men have we got to fight this battle? And you know, we've got a big army coming. How many men have we got? He didn't do that. He said, we need to guard first off. And if you want to read his prayer, 2 Chronicles chapter 19, I was going to read it for you. But it's, it's worthy of a sermon all on its own. Because he does four things. This is what he does in his prayer. The first thing he does to fill his faith tank is he reviews who God is. He remembers what God has done in the past. And his faith is strengthened because as God has done this in the past, the chances are that he's going to do it for me in the present as well. And he reflects and he reminds himself about who God is and the power of God. Go and read it. It's beautiful. The next thing is he reviews the pain. The next R, he reviews. He's not, he's not sweeping on the carpet and saying, oh, this would just go away. God, the problem is not that big. You know, really, it's okay, Lord. We, we can handle this thing. He's not doing that. He says, Lord, there's a whole bunch of kings who are coming to steal my stuff. And they promise to wipe me out. He is totally truthful about the dilemma that he is facing so the first thing he does is he reminds himself and he reflects on who god is the second thing he does is he reviews the problem the next thing he does is he reaffirms his faith he says lord i know who you are i know what my problem is and let me tell you now lord that i know that you can help me with this one too as you have in the past so you will too now and he reaffirms his faith and then you know how he responds with worship just with worship lord i can't fix this problem it's too big for me physically you know earthly speaking those guys are gonna wipe me out and he just does this and by the end 
of that period of time. Bring on however big an enemy you are, or once he has filled his faith tank. By those four things, review and remind yourself who God is. Review the problem with honesty. Reaffirm your commitment to do things God's way. If you do it wrong, don't do it God's way, then you're, in, you're on your own. And then lastly, respond with, with worship. That's a great picture of faith in who God is. The third thing I want to talk about on the subject of ratification is, let's ratify this, that faith is more than just belief. I need to tell you that. Some people think that faith is just about what we believe. No, it's not at all. You see, belief is different to conviction. Conviction is a graduation of belief. And we need to live our lives not so much through academic assent to religious facts that we say we believe in. We need to live our, little, our Christian lives out of that and into something that is action. That the difference between belief and conviction is action. That I take what I know and I say that I know and I say I believe and I allow it to impact and I live my life out of that. There's got to be an action factor to conviction. And Jesus illustrated this so many times in the things that he said to people while he was here on earth. He says to the, he says to, to the paralytic, he says, okay, your sins are forgiven, now stand up. He doesn't say your sins are forgiven, you're healed and walk away. He says your sins are forgiven and in the standing up, that man was healed. If he just lay there, trust me people, he would not have been healed. But even though he could have believed, you could have seen Jesus heal a hundred people. He said, like, Jesus, I really believe that you can heal. I really believe it. I've seen it. I've seen it, Jesus, you can heal me. And Jesus says, well, if you believe, then please stand up. Please stand up. You see, out of belief comes a conviction that is an action. And he looks at the different people. He says, he says to, the, to the, uh, the guy with the withered arm in the temple that day, he says, hey, you want to be healed? The guy says, that would be really nice. I, mean, I, I believe that you can do it, Jesus. I've seen you do it before. Jesus says, if you want to be healed, then stretch out your arm. And your problem is with a withered arm, you can't stretch it out. So, but he does. And in his trying and in his endeavor, his arm is healed. His belief became a conviction through an action. People, you can say you believe till you are blue in the face. But unless this leads to an action on your part to say that you are now living out what you say you believe, it is worth less than nothing. In fact, it's worse than that. It makes you a hypocrite. And it makes you a Pharisee because they believed a lot of stuff. But they just didn't love it. And so faith is more than just belief. Here's number four of this group. Faith is a living thing. A mustard seed. It has to die first. Put it in the ground. It has to die. When the water comes out of that little seed grows this little shoot. It has to die first. We spoke last week about the greatest battle we'll have to fight is not with the war around us, but is the war within us, is in our mind. And when we die to self like that seed dies in the ground, then all of a sudden new life can become birthed. That's like us. Jesus gave us a great picture of what that means. But, but faith is a living thing. It needs to be fed. Breakfast, lunch, supper. You've got to feed faith. It needs to grow like the investment thing. You've got the investment. You've got to put fresh deposits. You've got to, you've got to expand your faith. You've got to trust God. You've got to look for opportunities to, to trust God. You've got to look for opportunities for God to show off. Some people say that's not very reverent. <laughs> I love it. That I, my faith is going to take me into a realm where I'm going to be in trouble unless God comes through for me. And when we come, when that happens, we give God an opportunity to show off because I could never do that. Only God can do that. And God is looking for us as we grow in our faith to move into areas where we give God that opportunity to show His greatness, to show His power. He's not going to do it on His own. But when we start to live by faith, taking steps into realms and places we've never been before, trusting God to come through, it's a scary place to be. It's a very scary place to be. But when God comes through, who gets the glory? <laughs> Not us. But God gets the glory. And that pleases Him. It's all about pleasing God. Let me move to the last one quickly. People of the faith. We're ratifying this. People of the faith listen to a different voice. We don't listen to the, the voice of the prevailing wisdom of the day, which is generally the voice of the majority. If we listen to the prevailing wisdom of the day as a church, we're going nowhere, people. We have to listen for the voice of God. And when we do what He says, 
Now we're thinking. Now we're making progress. But, but there's this continual war of words in our mind. Who am I going to listen to? Am I going to listen to the guys who talk about common sense says this? You know, you've got to apply these, these worldly principles of this thing. Or am I going to listen to Jesus whispering in my ear saying, no, listen to him. Don't listen to him. Faith does not listen all the time to prevailing wisdom. There are times that I'm not saying we go against it. You know, if you don't hear the voice of God directly, then you use common sense. Okay? But sometimes you just know that this is God. And when you listen to that, how many times do we read in the Scripture that Jesus says, you have heard it said, but I say. We've heard it said a thousand times, have we not? But I say. And when we start to listen to Jesus, he says, you have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say, turn the other cheek. See, prevailing wisdom will say, stand up for yourself. Fight for your rights. You have rights, you know. Go look at the government. They'll tell you you've got human rights. Fight for your rights. And Jesus, you don't have any rights. You've got no rights. Listen to my voice. When people abuse you, people assault you, people turn the other cheek. What are you going to do? What are you going to listen to? Whose voice? Go and look up in the concordance how many times Jesus said, they say this, but I say that. It's always been like that. Even in the Old Testament. Now, let me give you a quick example of this. Then I'll, I'll, I won't do the last section today. We'll do that another time. Um, let me give you an example of this. When Joshua was instructed by God to cross the Red Sea. Not the Red Sea, the Jordan River. That was Moses. Jordan River. And he says this to Joshua, the river is in flood, but uh, I'm going to make a way for you to get across. And Joshua said, well, Lord, if you don't do it, I can't do it. How should I do it? He listens for the voice of God. Prevailing wisdom of the day would have said, hey, Joshua, just camp here for a while. Wait for the river to go down at its very lowest in the middle of winter when there's no rain. Then in the middle of summer when there's no rain, just, 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 just camp there for a little while. Prevailing wisdom would say, that's a good idea. But he listened to the voice of God that says, no, 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 here's what we're going to do. Joe, we're going to have some fun here. I want you to take the priests. I want you to line the whole nation up behind the priests and make the priests walk towards the river in flood. <laughs> That's going against prevailing wisdom. But he's listening to the voice of God. He said, okay, yeah, I can do that. So if the priests are carrying the Ark of the Covenant and everybody says, hey, where, where are we going? <laughs> and Joe said, we're going to cross the river. And Joe, 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 his general school, Joe, Joe, I don't know if you've noticed, but the river's in flood. I'm not sure that this is a good time. Can't we just hold on? Just, I've heard the voice of God. I'm not listening to prevailing wisdom. And as they begin to walk, it says in the scripture, as the feet of the priests touch the water, suddenly upstream something catastrophic happened. A damn wall was built by God, and the river, like water in a bath, just went down, and they crossed on dry ground. Then Joshua did this. He said to the priests, Hey, you priests, for the Ark of the Covenant. I want you to stand in the middle of the river and hold the Ark of the Covenant. And as people are coming past you, it will be an indication that this is what God has done. So they take the priest. Now a, there were two or three million people going to walk past them. That's a long stand. And I'm sure there were times when the priests are preaching sermons that the people are walking past because they've probably got nothing else to do. And it was generally, you know, as preachers, we preach three points. Three points and a poem at the end. Three points. And, and a and, and these three priests would have had the same sermon that I preach to you every single week. It's probably something like this. Hey, guys, when you get to the other side, give God his rightful place in your life. Hey, guys, when you get to the other side, honor his word. Hey, guys, third point, when you get to the other side, do something decent and constructive for the kingdom. Will you do that? Those three things. And when I think of the priest saying that to the millions of people coming past, same sermon over and over and over and over again, same three points. I think of myself, last 22 years. I've been saying the same three things. And you guys keep coming back. And, and, and next week I'm going to tell you the same three things. I'll just use different words. But I'll tell you the same three things. But give God his rightful place in your life. He has to be number one. The second thing you will hear me say a thousand times in a different way, you know, honor God, word of God. Live according to this phenomenal book over here. And thirdly, I'm going to tell you over and over again in different words, do something constructive for the kingdom so you have a decent faith story to tell at the end of your life when it's all poured out and you're ready to go. Those three things. Have you got it, people? Okay, so, so far, we will leave the applications for another time. We've got the implications of make sure you have the right faith. Make sure that your faith is not in faith. But make sure that, that your faith is authentic and it's yours. 
You're not piggybacking on somebody else's faith. You can't piggyback on your parents or your wife or your husband's faith. You've got to have your own. You've got to own your faith. And then the, the ratifications are, are abundant. Faith is more than belief. Let's turn our belief into, into an action. Faith is a living thing. It's like a mustard seed. It needs to be fed. It needs to be exercised. It needs to be, be stressed. Listen to the voice of Jesus. Do not listen to the voice of prevailing wisdom, no matter how commonsensical sometimes it may be. Remember that faith is just a test. Pass the test, people, for goodness sake. Don't give up. See your problems through the glasses, through the lenses of God, and your problems will look something different. Don't see God through your problems. See your problems through God, and you're going to be fine. You're going to write a great faith story. I'm excited to hear it one day. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you today for the gift of your Holy Spirit, who we haven't even touched on right now, who indwells us and empowers us and enables us and equips us to live a life of faith. We know, Lord, that we will never live it on our own. We have surely tried. Well, certainly I have, and I have failed every time. But, Lord, thank you that we please you, and you give us that, that approving look when you see us living our lives in faith. Not understanding. Understanding is totally overrated. Where do we think understanding is important? Not important at all. Faith is important. And that's why we call it faith. We call it faith because we don't understand all the time. Thank you for the greatness of who you are. Thank you that you're a God that we cannot understand. Your ways are far higher than ours. Your nature is far different to ours. Lord, we, are, we acknowledge our humanity and our frailty today. But Lord, I pray that each one of us, no matter what we're going through in our lives, would learn what it means to keep the faith to hold on to the faith. And some of us, Lord, I know, are holding on by our fingernails because life has been unkind to us. But you're saying with an approving smile, hang on, hold on. I will be with you. My spirit will strengthen you. Depend upon me. And then you'll write a great faith story. Pray that be true in our lives today, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.